My power, my pleasure, my pain, baby! That kind of sounded like Creed singing Seal. Yeah, we're talking about roses today, specifically four roses. And if you read the title of the video at all, you know that I think that this is the most underappreciated brand in bourbon right now. Am I drinking it currently? No, I'm not because it's super early in the morning. I didn't adjust the clock, it's 8.30. So I have coffee, I have Stone Creek coffee. This is a shameless self-promotion. If you like coffee, you should go to stonecreekcoffee.com down in the show notes below and you should get some coffee. Use the code whiskey15 for 15% off your purchase and free shipping. If you're new to the Droopy Whiskey channel, cool, awesome, glad to have you. Um, and if you love Four Roses, regardless, if you're new, you love Four Roses, go over to EntryProofPodcast.com. I did a episode with Brian Bikey, my partner at EntryProof, and uh, we really did a flavor breakdown of Four Roses. Today I'm going to get into history, I'm going to talk about why I think the brand's so dank. We really talk about flavor and recipes in that podcast episode. So EntryProofPodcast.com, it was like the second episode we released. There's only like five out right now, so... You can check it out. So we're gonna waste no time getting into it today. The specifics of why I think this is so rad. And it goes into the history. Four Roses has a long storied history. Ups and downs for sure. Started, not started in 1901. Started in like the 1860s, apparently. That's the rumor, is that this brand was market, marketed, produced, sold, going back as early as the Civil Freaking War. Now, the trademark for Roses wasn't uh, filed until the 1880s. 1888, specifically, by Paul Jones Jr. So this is the guy who, uh, Four Roses, as it exists today, gives credit for starting the Four Roses brand. But they weren't actually even at the Four Roses distillery, as we know it today, until the early 1920s, when they purchased the Frankfurt Distilling Company. And in that purchase, they acquired the Old Prentice Distillery, which is what we know today as the Four Roses Distillery. So the brand that was selling Four Roses, not sure where it was produced before, ended up acquiring the Old Prentice Distillery in the 1920s, and that's where the Four Roses brand has been produced to this day. Now, the Old Prentice Distillery was built actually in 1901. It is at risk of getting to Wikipedia on you, it's listed in the National Register of Historic Places, which is kind of cool. Does it have anything to do with bourbon? No. No, it does not. But it's an old building that is uh, produced in a particular style that is uh, somehow meaningful. I'm not an uh, architect. When the distillery was built, it was owned by J.T.S. Brown. You ever heard of him? Well, you probably have. The JTS Brown brand is actually still in production today. It has absolutely zero connection to Four Roses right now. It's owned by Heaven Hill. So it's the same kind of juice that's going into Elijah Craig, Henry McKenna, uh, J.W. Dant. Yeah, it's all the same stuff. So, so we've got the Old Prentice Distillery. That's in Lawrenceburg, Kentucky. That's where Four Roses, as I said, has been produced since the 1920s. Um, what's interesting about Four Roses, though, is that their aging and bottling facility is not in Lawrenceburg. It's down the road. It's like a 45-minute drive if you're making good time. That's in Cox's Creek, which is west of Bardstown, so southwest of Lawrenceburg. Uh, why do they do that? I'm sure it has something to do with, well, this is the property that we have, but it's got to be a little inconvenient to tank up all the new make distillate from the distillery, truck it over to Cox's Creek, and uh, let the barrels rest there. But on the upside, that gives you two places you can stop if you're headed through Kentucky and you're looking for some barrel strength single barrels because you can generally get them either at the distillery or at the aging facility. You can do tours of both too. Okay, so let's get into the, the brand development stuff. We know the brand started super old, I mean, 80, the 1880s or at, at the latest, like that's a crazy old brand for sure. 
Uh, and the company developed, uh, and it seems like it was around Prohibition time when maybe a few distilleries hit the market. That's when the Paul Jones company decided to go ahead and buy that old Prentice distillery in the 1920s. What happened in the 1920s? Prohibition. So given Prohibition, there are a lot of distilleries uh, trying to figure out what to do with their whiskey and that they couldn't sell it, created some financial troubles, and... Uh, Paul Jones Company acquires the old Prentice Distillery and actually has a license to go ahead and produce medicinal whiskey during that time. So that's good for them. Granted, there's not a ton of volume there. Plenty of bootleg volume, but not a lot of legal volume. Depends on how many prescriptions doctors decided to write for whiskey. Coming out of Prohibition, in that Four Roses one is one of the brands that was able to produce during the Prohibition time, they were one of the top brands for the 30s and 1930s and 1940s. They, apparently, the best-selling brand of bourbon was Four Roses in the 1930s and 1940s. So you get to the 1940s, a pretty highly sought-after brand for a company that's looking to uh, diversify and get into American whiskey. And that company was Seagram. So Seagram Corporation Company, whatever they're called. Canadian whiskey, Canadian liquor giant that obviously thrived in the midst of Prohibition, uh, getting their products smuggled into the States um, by folks like Capone. Uh, you know, I'm not saying that Seagram's was directly responsible for smuggling, uh, for illicit sale of alcohol in the United States, but they sold the people who were, obviously. That's neither here nor there. It has nothing to do with Four Roses, other than to say... In 1943, Seagram's bought Four Roses, the brand, from John Paul Jones. That's not right. Paul Jones Company. Now here's where it gets really interesting, is that Seagram's, even though Four Roses bourbon is a highly, highly successful brand in the United States, Seagram's being a, well, let's just say not a quality producer or not quality focused <laughs> in their production of whiskey, decides to say, you know what, we're going to make some changes. We're focused on blended whiskey, which does make sense if you understand the evolution of the uh, whiskey market from like the 50s through the 70s. Uh, it was not a great time for bourbon. Um, like 50s was the tail end of the bourbon heyday. And then we start seeing evolution of cocktails, blended whiskeys. gets really out of hand really fast. So Seagram's decides to invest heavily in blended whiskey. So here's what they do. They say, okay, we're only going to sell Four Roses straight bourbon in international markets, namely Europe and Asia. And then domestically, we're going to use the Four Roses brand as a blended whiskey brand. And then over time, from the late 40s, early 50s, through to you know, the 70s, 80s, even into the 90s, the Four Roses blended whiskey begins to devolve. Like, it's really bourbon or American whiskey mixed with new make spirit, it's it's like Kessler crap. Like, it's absolutely garbage. Whiskey, that's, be, that's what the Four Roses brand becomes known as in the United States underneath the Seagram ownership. That said, according to Jim Rutledge, the old Prentice distillery, what we know as Four Roses distillery, during that time, from the 1960s, through the 1990s, they weren't producing any of that blended whiskey. Now, who knows how much of the bourbon that they were producing went into that, uh, was mixed in different facilities, we don't know that, but we know that the old Prentice Distillery was still focused on producing straight bourbon specifically for the international market. So you could get, from the 1960s through the 1990s, pretty good Four Roses straight bourbon overseas in Europe in Asia, you just couldn't get it in the United States. You could only get kind of bullcrap underneath that Four Roses brand. So here's a risky thing. If you find Four Roses from 1970, and it was American, you know, it says Four Roses blended whiskey instead of Four Roses straight bourbon, you find a Dusty and you're stoked you got 1970s Four Roses, don't be stoked. It was not good. <laughs> not good at all. I mean, it's maybe a fine, like, a little collector's item. But I, I would recommend maybe you don't drink that. Or maybe don't buy it in the first place if you're looking for high-quality Dusties. Again, the reputation of Four Roses was bull crap. So you can get Four Roses straight bourbon in the United States for like 40 years. That said, there is a straight bourbon whiskey 
Kentucky Straight Bourbon Whiskey that you could get that was produced at the Old Prentice Distillery, the Four Roses Distillery, from 1975 until 1989. You know what it is? It's pretty cool. I guarantee you've heard of it. You know this brand. Eagle Rare 10 Year 101 Proof. This is where Eagle Rare started. The brand was produced by, uh, or was invented, created, during Seagram's ownership by a guy named Charles Beam. Yeah, same Beam family. Uh, Charles was master distillery at Old Prentice and uh, producing Four Roses for international markets and then created the Eagle Rare 10 year 101 proof which was sold in the United States. Again, 1975 to 1989 when the brand was sold by Seagram's. Now back to the Four Roses brand. Late in the 90s, uh, 1995 actually, is when Jim Rutledge becomes master distiller. And then shortly thereafter that, the brand starts changing hands. You know, conglomerate sells to conglomerate. So Seagram sells to so-and-so who sells to so-and-so. And it actually was sold like three times within the span of just a couple of years. When in 2001, it landed at Kirin Brewing Company. That's a Japanese-owned conglomerate that has some beer interests. Their only bourbon interest actually is Four Roses, at least as far as I can dig. They have some, some whiskey, Japanese whiskey interests, uh, some beer interests, New Belgium Brewery in fact, but it seems like their only bourbon interest at the time, as of now, is Four Roses. Uh, now, Jim Rutledge would tell it that he was able to convince, and maybe he was, I mean, props to that dude, um, but like, hey, let's get this product, let's sell Four Roses in the United States. Like, this is good stuff. Why are we shipping it all overseas? It'd be great if we could get it in and around Kentucky. And actually it was made first available in Kentucky only for about five years until about 2006 when Four Roses started to see wider distribution again, finally, in the United States. I think this is why Four Roses continues to be maybe underappreciated. Is the brand, sort of the, the revised, re revived brand, in the United States is not that old. Again, it's only been around here for a few years. 15 years, but a few relative to say, a Jim Beam or a Wild Turkey. But thankfully, it is here now. So a lot of the credit goes to Kieran Company and Jim Rutledge for bringing this brand and its amazing whiskey back to make it, make it available for us. So Jim was the master distiller from 1995 to 2016, and he remains a very, very uh, huge, huge figure in American whiskey. He has uh, released his own brand, Cream of Kentucky, partnered on a brand, Blue Run, um, so he's kind of enjoying retirement and working on side projects. Uh, rumor has it he's going to build a distillery, like a, be a partner in the building of a distillery. I don't know what the status of that project is, um, given COVID and all of that. But when he retired, quasi-retired in 2016, Brent Elliott took over. And Brent is, is highly respected in the industry as well. And Four Roses has uh, only continued to flourish under Brent's leadership, at least as master distiller. So let's talk about the products. What's being produced at Four Roses? And this is where I would also refer you to the Entry Proof Podcast, where we spend an hour talking about the different products at Four Roses. First, we need to understand that Four Roses is highly unique in that they produce 10 different bourbon recipes. That's, that's a lot. Like, Heaven Hill produces one. <laughs> one bourbon recipe. Of course, they have, uh, you know, like a corn whiskey, they have rye, they have a wheat whiskey, um, whereas Four Roses only produces bourbon, but they have 10 different bourbon recipes. That's pretty unique. So the way they go about accomplishing these 10 different recipes is they have two mash bills, a high rye, that's 35% rye, and then a low rye, which is 20% rye. That's still pretty high rye um, relative to some other companies, like a Heaven Hill or a Buffalo Trace, use very low rye in their ride whiskey mash bills. And then they use different yeast strains to help create certain flavors in the distillation process that then get brought out with aging. So two mash bills times five 
uh, yeast strains gives us a total amount of possible recipes. That is 10, 10 different recipes. Now the recipes at Four Roses are represented in a four letter code and there are resources online. I'll actually drop one um, from Bourboner down in the show notes that help you go like, oh, what are all these recipes? And if you get actually a Four Roses uh, private selection single barrel, they've got a breakdown of the recipes on the little card that tell you kind of what you should expect in terms of flavor from a particular recipe. Now, maybe a little bit I find these flavor recommendations to be helpful, but there's so much variability from barrel to barrel that it's like, okay, well, we'll see. I'm not really worried. I don't chase certain recipes over another because of the massive variability from barrel to barrel. Although uh, other people who I respect, uh, who have great palates, do chase certain production lines of certain recipes. Good for them. So the four letter representation of the recipe always starts with O. And O stands for the production facility, which is Four Roses Distillery. Why is it an O? I have no idea, actually. And then the mash bill is represented by a B or an E. B being the high rye, 35%. E being the low rye, the 20%. Why is it B and E for high rye or low rye? Again, I have no idea. S is the third letter in this four letter code. It just stands for straight whiskey, which is all they produce under the Four Roses brand. So I don't know if this four letter code goes back to the way like Seagram's ran things because they were producing so much crap. And this was like their way to tell which barrels came from where and what was inside of it. It's possible. And then finally the yeast strains. Again, there's five. There's V, K, Q, O, and F. And some of those are more rare than others. We talk about that on the pod. Four Roses uses these 10 recipes to create as many as six really regular products. The first one being their standard Four Roses 80 proof bourbon. Now, I don't particularly like this product. I wish Four Roses standard release was in the 90 proof range. I'd probably get it on the regular, but uh, 80 proof just doesn't do it for me. In this particular product, they use all 10 recipes. So uh, that, that amount of different whiskey going in, I'm sure allows them to maintain a very, very set profile. And also allows them to use all kinds of different ages of whiskey. As it's a fairly big batch, a lot of different ingredients, a lot of different age going in. In general though, I find the product to be kind of spice heavy, thin, uh, not a lot of sweet oak to balance out this kind of thin spiciness. So it's not for me. The next product they have is Four Roses Small Batch. A small Batch actually comes in a bottle that looks like this, but it's got a certain kind of label on it, kind of a beige label that goes right here. And the small batch is uh, better, I think, than the standard Four Roses yellow label, what they call the 80 proof, because it used to have a yellow label. Now it is also a beige label. So small batch, I think, is a step up from that. It uses four different uh, recipes, OBSQ, OBSK, OESQ, and OESK. And it's on the more spicy end of the spectrum of the Four Roses releases. It does have a little bit more age. It's, you know, the blend is maybe produced with a little bit more care. Um, so it's a solid, solid bourbon. It's going to run you in that, you know, $30 price range, whereas the standard Four Roses yellow label is about 20 bucks. This is where Four Roses actually gets into the 90 proof range too, which is helpful. Just delivers a little bit more flavor. Now the third release in the Four Roses series is one of my favorite whiskeys. You've heard me talk about it a lot. It's that standard 100 proof Four Roses single barrel. So that's the OBSV recipe. It tends to be creamy. It is high rye, the B, high rye, but it, I, I get a lot of creaminess, a lot of sweetness, a lot of fruitiness, even in spite of the high rye, which it just is a really, really well-balanced product. It is a single barrel, so there is some variability, but um, I just love that bottle so much and it's around $40. Uh, it's one of the best values, I think, in bourbon. And that 100 proof, is that's right in my money zone. Then we get to the release of the fourth rose, as Four Roses hailed it, when they released the 
Four Roses Small Batch Select. That's a 104 proof, non-chill filtered blend of six different mash bills. OBSV, OBSF, and OBSK, then OESV, OESF, and OESK. Before I keep going, I should go back and mention that the standard single barrel release is like seven-ish years on average. I mean, not bad. It can get into the eight years. Pretty solid, solid bourbon. Good proof, good age, good profile. The small batch select is in that seven year range, six to seven years, according to the Four Roses website. 104 proof, non chill filtered, as I said. Um, so it, it it's you know packing plenty of flavor, um, but it's different, of course, than the straight OBSV because it's a blend. And I found this to be the most floral of the standard Four Roses options. The ones you can just go and buy off the shelf. It's, it's punchy a little bit because that 104 proof and that it's not super aged. So it, it, it's got a kind of in your face profile, but it's not delivering like a whole crap ton of spice. It is spicy because, you know, Four Roses does high rye, high rye bourbon. That's what they do, 20% or 30%, this being a blend of both. But some of the yeast strains really offer up a lot of rosy notes, for lack of a better term, in high floral characteristics. Jasmine, honeysuckle, and you get kind of a bouquet of flowers in the Four Roses Small Batch Select that is balanced out by spice, uh, kind of oily mouthfeel. What makes me not like the Small Batch Select as much as the standard 100 proof single barrel OBSV is that it's not the most sweet. Like, I want a, a little bit more sweetness, a little bit more fruitiness out of my bourbon, if I could choose perfectly. And I find that that's where the small batch select just doesn't quite get there for me. Granted, really solid product. I'm not, not knocking it. It's really good. Um, it's just not exactly what I would want. The price point on this one's a little bit higher, too. We're talking about $50 to $55. So yellow label, 20-ish. Small batch, 30-ish. Single barrel, 40-ish. Small batch select, 50 to 55. And that makes up the standard Four Roses lineup. The Four Roses, as they say. That said, if you're a bourbon geek, which if you're making it this far in this breakdown of Four Roses, you are a bourbon geek. You're interested in the Four Roses' more limited offerings. And those include the private select, barrel strength, barrel picks, and the limited editions. So these barrel proof picks, you can, they're store picks. You know, a store has to commit to buy a barrel and then Four Roses will roll out somewhere in the range of four to seven barrels uh, for the store to choose from. Uh, so you're kind of, you, you get four to seven recipes and you have to choose one. So you can't go in and say, I want an OESK and they give you an OESK. You have to choose which one you like best. And like I said, I'm not chasing recipes. Do it blind and pick the best barrel. Hopefully stores take good palettes with them. So they're like, yeah, I know I'm getting a great barrel of Four Roses. And then whatever recipe it happens to be, great, awesome. But hypothetically, a private select store pick could be any of the 10 recipes. They have shown up in any of the 10 recipes. Some are certainly more common than others. Uh, but I know a lot of people who've collected all Tenton recipes. I have, I have seven of the ten. Um, I'm hoping to get all the ten at some point. Slow and steady wins the race. But I love these things. Each one is different. I mean, the the change in recipe, the change in age, ranging ranging from eight to you know eleven years. Tasted one with Brian that was like fourteen years. Uh, that just produces a lot of variability. But I've not had one that just sucked. I've had some that were okay, but then others that were absolutely mind-blowing. So these are fun to hunt for me. Anytime a store in Wisconsin releases one of these, I'm trying to get it because I love it so much. The proofs range from like 110 to 125. I don't think I've ever seen one higher than 125, and that Four Roses entry proof is lower than a lot of other distilleries. They're not you know, filling barrels up at 125 proof. Whereas like Buffalo Trace, Heaven Hill, they're, they're maxing out the legal entry proof at 125. Four Roses does lower it a little bit, 120. And then their rickhouses are not very high, like relative to some others. They're very, very uh, short 
very not tall. I forget how many exactly. It's probably, I think, 10 levels high, 10 barrels. I'm pretty sure that's it. Whereas others can be as high as 40. It can get pretty crazy. And just that lack of temperature variability and then high temps that occur at the high levels of the rick houses, uh, which often produce some very high alcohol barrels, Four Roses doesn't have that. So we see a lot of uh, similarity in the proof levels between single barrels. Again, I see them often 120 to 125 or 110 to 125, generally for these single barrel releases. Then once a year or sometimes twice a year, Four Roses will drop a limited edition. Sometimes these can show up as limited edition single barrel releases that get a special like print treatment on the front. More often than not though, they show up in limited edition, limited edition, limited edition small batches. Um, and these are great. Like Jim Rutledge was a solid blender. Brent Elliott, I think is a really good blender. Um, and if I could choose one release to get every year, I think it'd be this one. I mean, sure, BTAC, uh, William Luru Weller, George T. Stagg, those are great. But I think the Four Roses profile actually, it, it hits me a little bit better. And the, the age of the whiskeys going in here and the proof point tends to suit me a lot better. You know, those uh, George T. Staggs, William Leroux Weller, they, the, I mean, they can get hot, which is fine, but, um, you know, I want to be able to taste my whiskey. And I've done an episode about barrel proofs where, you know, your taste perception actually goes down as proof goes up. So barrel proof like this one, the 2015 limited edition small batch at 110 proof, that's like, oh yeah, give me like undiluted flavor at a proof point that really like uh, it packs a wallop. Like it's, it's enough to, you know, bring some intensity to your mouth, but not enough to actually like peel the skin from the sides of your mouth. Uh, that's what I'm talking about. And the age ranges that go into these are, you know, anywhere from 10 to 11 to 20 to 24 years old. Now, when they're not dropping a single barrel limited edition or the limited edition small batch that normally shows up, you might get something like the Four Roses Al Young 50th anniversary. And that's a unicorn among unicorns. When that dropped, people were like, wow, this is amazing. The bottle was beautiful. And I'm thankful I was actually able to try this on our podcast recording. It was really good. I mean, I really like these limited edition small batches and it was different than that. Like it was a very delicate tasting experience, but it's one of those bottles that, you know, if I had a list of the top 10 bottles I'd like to have, that would, that would probably be on it. Now, if you've been hanging with me this whole time, I said at the start, Four Roses is one of the most underappreciated brands in my mind. And that's because, you know, as we look at the secondary values of whiskeys, the limited edition releases from Four Roses on the secondary market don't have near the price, the pull power of, say, Buffalo Trace Antique Collection, when I think the quality of what they're doing is at least equal to that. Also, the quality of what's on the shelf, whether that be the Four Roses 100 Proof Single Barrel or the Small Batch Select, is equal to what Buffalo Trace is putting out in, you know, uh, Buffalo Trace or Eagle Rare or E.H. Taylor. But we don't see people taking pictures of, you know, Four Roses standard single barrels and putting them on Instagram. Why? I think it's because a lot of you just haven't had it. And it's not massively distributed everywhere. My boy from North Carolina, he's, he was unaware of the glories of Four Roses. And uh, hopefully we can open people's eyes because if, if I want to see a brand flourish because of the quality of their stuff, it's definitely Four Roses. I think because they're limited editions, you know, they do, again, generally one a year as opposed to the four that come out of Buffalo Trace. They don't have a standard released barrel proof that you can go and get. You know, again, it has to be the store pick, so that makes it hard to experience the high, high end of Four Roses. And the brand has not been in the United States for that long. You know, again, going back to 2006 is when it reached wider distribution across the states. So if you've not given Four Roses a try, I highly recommend it. If you're like, dang, I can't get Eagle Rare, I can't get E.H. Taylor, I can't get Henry McKenna, well, go get a standard Four Roses 100 proof single barrel and enjoy the crap out of it. And if you don't like it, you can hold me personally responsible, but not really. 
Really interesting story behind this brand. Some great master distillers in Jim Rutledge and Brent Elliott. Really interesting production model with the 10 recipes, high emphasis on blending, and some absolute bangers in their limited edition releases. So get hyped for Four Roses. Squad, I hope you enjoyed that overview of the Four Roses brand. Personally, huge fan. Floral, fruity, spicy, sweet bourbons. Uh, for you to enjoy, for sure. I know you will. Again, don't forget to check out that Entry Proof Podcast, entryproofpodcast.com. If you want to support the podcast or support the channel, well, there's a couple ways you can do that. One, like this video. Two, subscribe to the channel. Three, go to patreon.com slash entryproofpodcast and support the channel where you'll get a bunch of dope swag and then you'll also uh, be eligible to purchase some single barrel picks that we are doing through Entry Proof Podcast. I hope y'all have a good week. Stay healthy, stay safe, and remember to keep it neat. <laughs>